Okay, hello once again. I think everyone is now connected and ready to learn something new. Uh, good day, everyone. Once again, welcome to the CP Confederation of European Probation webinar on risk and needs assessment in probation with different perspectives. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be a moderator today. My name is Jana Spero, and I'm a Secretary General of Confederation of European Probation. With me today, you have my dear colleague, Anna, who you already met through many emails and all the help she provided for all participants. She is a CEP policy officer and she will be with us um, here all day and will be able to help us with any issues. I would also like to welcome our distinguished speakers today. We have with us uh, Amy from UK, we have Vesna from Croatia, and we have Gerhard, who will be representing Norway today. I really want to thank our presenters. More about them you will learn soon. Okay, and now at the beginning, I would like to share a few informations with you. Uh, the concept of today's webinar is that first we will listen to presentations from our three presenters, and only after that we will have a session for questions and answer. I will ask you, all of you who will have any questions for any of our speakers to use the questions and answer function that is available in a Zoom platform so that we can later on in the, when the time comes, Anna will read out loud the questions and our presenters will give you an answers. So that is about the principles. So just please write down and prepare questions during the presentations and the conversation part dialogue will be later on. Also, I would kindly ask you uh, something that Anna already said an email that after this webinar today, we would really be grateful if you would use only two minutes of your time to give us a feedback because it's very important for us to know what you thought about uh, uh, our webinar so that next time we can be even better. For CP, it's very important that we have a really great quality of our events. So your feedbacks means a lot. I know if you've been following our uh, webinars before, you see how we are improving and evolving from uh, event to event. That's all thanks to you. Also, I would like to mention uh, that this webinar is being recorded, so um, please be, be aware that uh, we will use this for our purposes of making uh, records um, of the uh, webinar. Okay, now when we uh, know some uh, basic uh, informations, let me tell you something very interesting. And that is that uh, this webinar is followed by 108 people who applied to learn more about the assessment in probation. And this is like amazing number. And this shows how the topic of assessment for probation professionals is really something that is very important. Everyone who works with the offenders knows very well that assessment is a crucial for the good work that we will have during our time with the offender. Because the most important for every probation officer worldwide is to know what to do, how to work with the offender in order to help that person not to re-offend again. And there are many ways how to do this. But of course, assessment is a crucial to know what is there to attack, what kind of needs there are that needs to be addressed by our professionals. So many countries have many different tools and this webinar is here to show three different uh, approaches to assessing of offenders. And I hope that everybody will learn something from this. There is no uh, one right answer. There is uh, only the best possible practice. So this is what we are going to talk about. And it's 
for that reason, I'm really happy that we have so many participants in this webinar. I already told you 108 people, and this time we have uh, countries even outside of the scope of European Union and the Council of Europe. I would also like to warmly welcome our colleagues from Japan, from uh, UNAFE. So it's very nice to know that everywhere in the world, the webinar is found to be important. Uh, also, let me highlight just that we have representatives of England, Norway, Slovenia, uh, Czech Republic, Netherlands, Belgium, Romania, Finland. Then we have um, representatives from Spain. We have uh, even Brazil. We have Finland, Estonia, Malta, Denmark, Moldova, France, Croatia, Armenia. Uh, we have Germany, Hungary, Italy, Philippines, Catalonia, Ireland, uh, Falkland Islands, Turkey, and I think I mentioned uh, all the countries represented. So thank you very much for being here. In order to leave you to this excellent program, let me just go quickly to today's program. So after these opening words, our first presentation will be the one from Norway. The second presentation will be from Croatia and the third one will be from United Kingdom. After that, we will have questions and answer and the closing remarks. Okay, so um, let me start by introducing the presentation number one, the opening presentation, needs and resources assessment in Norwegian corrections, the BRIC tool. Norwegian uh, correctional service is very well known in different countries, especially due to Norway grants and some of you may already heard, but some of you never heard of the BRIC and how assessment tool is seen from the Norwegian perspective. I'm really happy to have today with us Gerhard Plovek, who is a former senior advisor from the correctional services in Norway. But also I have to highlight that Gerhard also worked for a Dutch probation service. So he also understand how it worked in Netherlands, but also spent a lot of time working for the probation services Norway. It's my special pleasure because Gerhard is an honorary member of CP. He used to be a vice president and it's always nice to see him in our activities. So I know that he's very well uh, known internationally and that he knows how uh, webinars and workshops for CP functions. So I'm leaving this webinar in his safe hands. Gerhard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, everybody can hear me, I hope, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to uh, underline that um, I'm stepping in for my colleague, Christian Tonberg, who originally would uh, be making this presentation. Uh, I am retired, uh, but I've been working with BRIC for, uh, for a long time when I was working for the uh, Norwegian Correctional Services. Uh, could I please have my presentation on the screen, uh, Anna? Now you should be able to see it. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, everybody can see it, I hope. Okay, <clears throat> I'd like to present the uh, assessment instrument that is used in the Norwegian Correctional Service, which might be a little different from most of the other instruments that are being used elsewhere. We have called it BRIC, uh, not because it will be just another brick in the wall, but because it is the Norwegian abbreviation for Needs and Resources Assessment in Corrections. Next one, please. Uh, yes, it's a bit slow, but I'm changing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, it's not changing now. I don't know. Now. Uh, yeah. There you go. This is number two, yeah. The instrument is based on two different theoretical approaches, and it is an effort to integrate those two with each other in order to obtain a clear picture of the areas in the offender's life that need to be addressed, either because they constitute a problem that is contributed to the offence in question, or because they present an opportunity 
for improving the offender's life situation by better making use of the various skills or other qualities that they might have. Both approaches are well known, but I will just repeat some of the highlights in so far as they are relevant for the development of BRIC, which took place um, at the end of the 2010s, so 2008, 9 and 10. The first one is uh, what works or the risk needs responsivity model. Its primary focus is on factors that have shown to be related to an increased risk of reoffending through evidence based research. And the second is what many consider to be its counterpart, the desistance model, where the attention is directed at factors that reduce the risk of reoffending. Research and theory development may be said to aim at the characteristics of two different groups, respectively those who do reoffend and those who do not reoffend. Next one, please, Anna. I'm, I'm changing Gerhard, but I don't know it's going super slow. Sorry? I'm changing, but it goes yeah. super slow. Okay. Yeah, Sorry I, for I, that. <laughs> I'll take some pauses, but uh, okay. In short, uh, RNR tries to identify factors that can determine the intensity, the contents, and the form of the required intervention in order to reduce the risk of reoffending. In itself, this would present a possibility to look at positive elements in the offender's life as well. But the focus is specifically on criminogenic factors, those that promote criminal activities. The interventions consist mostly of structured activities, often with manuals, and they are generally speaking based on cognitive behavioral theory. Some well-known tools, tools are the LSIR, the Level of Service Inventory Revised in Canada, and OASIS, the Offender Assessment System in, uh, that is used in England and Wales. These have all been revised and improved over the years, and I will not go into that here. This is just for illustrating the background of BRIC, the, the, the st starting situation we had. I will say something though about why we did not just make another R&R tool. Next one, please. It's coming, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> you can always hope. I go now. Okay, in our view, the what works based assessment has some flaws, which are centered around the concept of de-individualization because of the reasons shown on the slide here, which have been claimed by various critics. Offenders' needs are being quantified through a scoring system and seen as dynamic criminogenic factors or risks. With its emphasis on an evidence base, only those factors that have shown a positive correlation with reoffending at an aggregated level are taken into account, leaving out possible individual variations in these criminogenic factors as well as those factors that are not considered criminogenic in statistical terms, but that may be highly criminogenic in isolated cases. A rather dubious addition of the scores on the separate sections of the assessment tool is then used as a guideline for decisions that have great influence on the offenders' lives. The earlier versions of, for example, OASIS also showed little attention for the individual offender and his relationship with the assessor nor for his personal opinion on factors influencing the offending behavior. Next one, please. The desistance approach, however, does take the aforementioned individual factors into account. It focuses on the process of desisting. Desisting is moving away from criminal activities and acknowledges this as a slow and gradual development with many possible moments of relapse in various degrees. A central element is the offender's own wish to desist and how to support this by finding strong points, capacities, skills, know-how, etc., etc., that may be used in a journey towards an adaptation to the values of the community. In doing so, the same kind of factors that are considered to be criminogenic in the R&R approach also need to be assessed and addressed, but from a supportive standpoint and not as a mathematical basis for decisions on, for example, regime change, uh, granting of leave, release on license, or different types of monitoring after release. When we started developing BRIC, we wanted to integrate the best of both worlds and leave out that which we considered less relevant for an effective reintegration process. Next one, please. <clears throat> so here are some of BRIC's central features. 
It is an electronic tool that must be must be seen not as a decisive moment in the implementation of the sentence and its aftermath, but as a guide for the conversation with the offender. We will not dive too deep in what sometimes may be very complicated issues, but we want to, as it were, scratch the surface in order to be able to refer people to the right program, the right regime, the right partner in administrative cooperation, and sometimes the right uh, more specialized assessment tool for more serious matters. We look at criminogenic factors, but we also look for other individual factors that have not shown correlation with recidivism at an aggregate statistical level. And we ask the offender for his own opinion on this. In addition, we ask about resources, competence, skills, strengths, and how these might be used in contributing to the community in a feeling of getting a better grip on one's own life conditions, on feelings of mastering and agency. Next one, please. <clears throat> Sorry. The assessment is carried out together with the offender and where possible, the assessor and the offender will look at the same screen. This was the intention so that the offender will be more involved in the process and may develop a sense of ownership and responsibility. His or her own vision of the future is discussed and written in the file. We assume that this stimulates a feeling of procedural justice of being treated in a fair way. The personal relationship that we hope will develop from this way of working supports the dynamic security in prisons and probation offices. <clears throat> the separate sections in the assessment tool are not scored quantitatively, preventing possible labeling effects that may disturb the reintegration process. <clears throat> in the end, the results will be used by case managers in their further contact with the offender. Next one, please. So what does it look like then? I've brought some screenshots to illustrate Brick, just a couple. Um, to the left, you can see all the categories listed and the one on screen is highlighted. At the top right, there is a possibility for reservation in case the offender does not want to discuss this particular subject. The original idea was that the questions would be included in quite an impersonal and formal way. As you can see, it is formulated as what is the convicted person's highest level of completed education instead of what is your highest level of completed education. The idea behind this <clears throat> was that the assessor would be stimulated to reformulate in his own words and thereby create a more casual atmosphere where the personal relationship would have a better opportunity to flourish. I'll come back to this point a little later. The separate questions also provide for an opportunity to decline to answer, as you can see the, uh, among the alternatives. Next one, please. Towards the end of the same section, the questions on skills, etc., come up. As you can see, the question marks may be clicked on in order to get a further explanation of the intention behind the question uh, uh, below on the screen. There is, of course, also a manual for Brick, and all this is part of the training for the assessors. Next one, please. <clears throat> Towards the end of the conversation, sorry. <clears throat> Towards the end of the conversation, the offender will be asked about his own self-assessment, where also issues like his ideas about the future during and after the sentence are dealt with, much, much in line with the, uh, the thinking around the good life model. Next one, please. So the final section includes the assessor's general impression and allows for the offender to comment on, on this. Okay, ne uh, next one, please. Those were the, uh, the screenshots. Brick has been evaluated by external researchers a couple of times since its introduction during the pilot phase, as well as later on after its national implementation in 2017. These reports resulted among other things in establishing some strong and some weak points. The assessors emphasized that they, generally speaking, were very satisfied with the contents of the tool and its method, although some comments were made. They were also pleased with the way in which a relationship could develop. Caseworkers appear to be satisfied with the information that they acquired through the BRIC data later on in the process, allowing for an effective reintegration. Offenders mentioned the same advantages as the assessors, and in several cases, they said they were pleased to be asked about their positive qualities and not just about their problems. For some of them, it, this 
uh, appeared to be the first time in their life that somebody had asked them about what they actually could do and not what, what they could not do. The possibility for a personal comment was also appreciated. A negative aspect of the assessment process was that it might create expectations that turn out to be very difficult to meet because not everything, of course, is under the control of the correctional service and partners in, in uh, social welfare and, uh, and such may not always be able to deliver in a satisfactory way. So it creates expectations that uh, sometimes are not realized. It was also said that the whole assessment was too time consuming for staff as well as for, for offender. And finally, the possibility to not answer certain sections or questions has led to a relatively high percentage of refusals, which I shall now discuss briefly. Next one, please. In the course of the year 2021, we began to worry about the high percentage of refusals to participate in BRIC at all. As you can see from the table on the screen, the number was rising from 2018 through to 2021. Um, and uh, according to the prognosis, it would in 2021 be well above one third. So we decided at the time to make a questionnaire with a few questions about the possible reasons for refusal. We asked those offenders who had refused, the assessors, and in a number of cases, also the unit managers, in order to hear what their views were and how the problem might be tackled. The response percentage was not extremely high, but it was satisfactory in that it gave us quite a lot of information. Representativeness was also not a prerequisite since we were more interested in the questions of which the various reasons could be instead of how many times specific reasons were mentioned. Next one, please. A few people responded that they had not received enough information, 4% of the, of the total, as you can see on the screen. Uh, a total of 24% does not trust the correctional service to treat the information in a way that is safe for the offender. This percentage, by the way, was considerably higher among imprisoned offenders than, than among those who were serving a community sentence with the probation service. Almost half of the respondents have their doubts about the value for themselves, and a quarter refused because they have been assessed earlier in some form. So these are the motivations for refusing to participate in BRIC at all. Next one, please. Uh, the conclusions in relation to the offenders focus partly on communication issues, like the presentation of the contents and the advantages of participating or the avoidance of misunderstandings. Applying a certain amount of pressure appears to be counterproductive. The internal communication between units in the correctional service in case of transfers also requires some attention, since data not always are sent from one unit to another, which may lead to the same offender having to answer questions again and again after they already have done so somewhere else. Next, please. Some of the things that we initially thought were good ideas turned out to have some serious disadvantages. The sharing of the screen implied that the offender and the assessor must sit beside each other instead of opposite. This was considered less successful as it made both parties very conscious of the situation and served as a break rather than a stimulus for a more natural conversation. The shared screen was not possible anyway during the COVID pandemic. The recommendation here was to ask the offender for his opinion on what had been written down at the end of the assessment. So show him the screen afterwards instead of all the way during the process. Another sort of miscalculation was the formal way in which the questions were formulated using the offender instead of you, as I illustrated before. Both parties indicated that this created a distance since the assessor not always found the right way to phrase the questions and then resorted to what was written. So it was kind of, sort of counterproductive. Uh, finally, even though this skill is emphasized during training, many assessors thought it was difficult to navigate from one place to the other in line with which subject would come up in a natural conversation. Changing from one section to another should be made easier. Next one, please. As for the process, staff suggested a more structured selection of candidates combined with more realistic production quota. In order to reach the required production numbers in the course of a year, some categories of offenders were approached who, in principle, would benefit little from participating in an assessment. 
examples are those with very short sentences or those who have been sentenced for offenses which are hardly related to reintegrated reintegrative factors, for example, speeding, driving on the influence or certain economic offenses. Many of these are well rooted in society and do not need extra assistance in returning after their sentence. Other factors that were mentioned were related to training, role distinctions between assessor and case manager, and structured exchange with partners in administrative collaboration. Next one, please. So over to some further developments uh, that I have been uh, uh, that, that I've been hearing about from uh, Christine, from my colleague. <laughs> um, as it appears, a version has been developed now specifically for 15 to 24 year olds, which will probably be launched in 2023. The correctional service is working on a whole new registration system and case management system, and Brick will be a part of it. And in the, in the course of that, also this specific. Uh, type of brick for the younger ones will be uh, will be included. Um, in addition, a new sentence planning instrument will be developed, uh, and it will be used as an extension to brick. So the the connection between brick and the sentence planning afterwards in the sentence implementation will be uh, structured in a better way. And finally, the directorate has requested a change in legislation. Uh, at the Ministry of Justice, making which would make it possible to use BRIC also for persons who are on a remand, because now we can only use it on persons who uh, have been already been sentenced. The answer for that, uh, as, as I understand it, is pending. Next one, please. Thank you for your attention. And uh, this is the email address of my colleague. Uh, so any questions that you might have afterwards, um, after this workshop is over, you can uh, direct to uh, to her to this email address. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Gerhard. This was really interesting to listen. I think that now everybody sees how uh, assessment tool can be approached from the different angles. Um, I am sure that there are questions uh, because I already see in our questions and answers that something came. So stay with us, Gerhard. We will uh, we will be hearing more from you. Uh, in uh, when the time for uh, questions come. Thank you so much for presentation. So one virtual applause for uh, Gerhard. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And now moving to our second presentation about risk assessment tool from the Croatian perspective. We have with us Vesna Zelic Ferencic. She is the head of the probation office in Croatia, the big probation office in the capital city of Zagreb. She is in charge for all the probation staff and all offenders in the surrounding area of Croatia. She works uh, already almost a decade for Croatian prob probation service, and she's very active in, uh, in when working with a project. She works on European Union project, Council of Europe projects, and Norway grants project. And I think Vesna is now already very known to international society, to CEP family, because she's very active in CEP events. If you attended last week's um, workshop in Romania in Bucharest on interagency cooperation, you could have heard Vesna talking about Roma mentors. But today we have a pleasure and honor to see how Vesna see assessment tool in Croatia. So Vesna, it's nice to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And hi, everybody. Thank you, Anna, again for this um, wonderful introduction. I'm very uh, happy to be here with you. And um, I'm a bit nervous because I really don't like this online uh, events, but I think I will manage. I will try to share my presentation with you and uh, keep your fingers crossed that everything will work. Um, okay, so um, I will uh, give you a um, Croatian perspective on our assessment tool. Uh, we are, uh, to, I'm going to talk to you about today a little bit, uh, I will give you an introduction in um, the development of the tool that we are using. We, we have a short abbrevi abbreviation for it, we call it SPP. It means the um, offenders um, um, 
um, assessment. Um, so it's um, it's we usually use this term. So please uh, have understanding for me when I use it. It means um, it's just an abbreviation, just like brick in Norway. It's uh, our our term. Uh, for, for our assessment tool. So I will try to give you an overview of the instrument. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of time, so I will be short and I presented some screenshots uh, in English uh, of the instrument. So you will have um, a view on how does it look. And instead of a conclusion, well, we will discuss a bit about pros and cons uh, from the practitioner's perspective in using this instrument. Um, for the introduction, I need to say that um, that uh, the um, uh, probation probation service is a very young uh, probation service. We are only eleven years old, so uh, we uh, in our development we very relied on um, our colleagues' uh, practice from abroad. So we developed our probation service using ex experiences from our colleagues abroad, and we used. Uh, several kinds of projects and funds from different kinds of sources to, to support the development of our probation service. And one of the activities of one of the projects was the cooperation with our British colleagues, and uh, we uh, adopted their uh, OASIS uh, risk assessment tool. So from the 2011 till 2015, uh, we used uh, this uh, first version of our SPP that was based on OASIS, and uh, we used it uh, for almost all offenders, uh, and it was very time-consuming and very um, uh, hard on our probation officers because we uh, applied the instrument uh, without almost very little criteria for all offenders. And in 2015, we uh, gathered enough um, uh, collected data to do uh, an adjustment of our instrument. So we uh, um, decided that there are a few parts that are not very um, cultural friendly for the Croatian society and for our offenders that we left out in the assessment and that we uh, put in some more questions and adapted the instrument to better to fit our needs. So our, uh, we have the second version of it now and it's implemented. I will give you some more information about how we use it. We don't use it now for all, all of offenders. We have a lot of cr criteria for which we use this full version and for which we don't use it. Of course, as um, Gerhard already said, uh, this model is based on the R and R model. So I'm sure uh, you all know about the model. So I won't. Uh, so I won't talk a lot about it. Um, we are uh, focusing on the risks of reoffending and serious uh, harm. We are also trying to target the criminogenic needs of the offender. And we are also trying to, um, to have the, responsivi the responsivity of the intervention to tackle the offenders that we need to, uh, that we need to get. So we are trying to screen the offenders that are medium and high risk because uh, we all know that the ones uh, of, uh, that are assessed, uh, that are lo low risk, need a little or no intervention at all. So, as I said, we are using uh, the second version that we adapted, and we also have um, uh, two types of our assessments tool. Uh, one is uh, a longer uh, version of the SPP, the full version, that we use only for the offenders that have some specific uh, types of sanctions as protective supervision. Uh, and uh, we have um, the probation officers can choose whether to apply it with other types of sanctions during the, the, the period that the offender is, is included in probation. Uh, but we have a short version th that is uh, much, uh, much less time consuming and we use it for all other types of uh, uh, sanctions that are, that are uh, implemented in probation. We are, of course, analyzing current and previous offenses. Uh, we are taking into account statistic and dynamic factors. So we are, uh, the first version of the 
of the risk assessment tool um, it was more focused on the dynamic factors and we left this into in uh, during the, the adjustment of the assessment tool but we also added some more statistic factors because uh, and we we put some uh, weighted values and scores on this uh, on this part because we decided that the, this gives us um, a more quality um, overview on the on the status of our offenders. So, in addition to um, to uh, assessing the risk, we are also including the part of protective factors because we have this um, questionnaire uh, that uh, uh, is. Um, uh, we are um, uh, adding some points and some scores for certain uh, uh, topics, and then we are describing the offenders functioning in this part. And in the end, we are also adding the, the protective factors, which are the, um, uh, the strengths of the offender and which are the parts of, of his life that he's more successful in. Uh, we are also assessing the risk uh, of harm to other people and uh, the risk of uh, harm to, uh, of, of the offender to himself. Uh, as a result, we have this uh, assessment of probability, probability of reoffending, and we have classified it low, medium and high risk. And we are also having the assessment of a, a level of serious crime. So we are also classifying it as very high, high, medium or low. And uh, it can be a combination. So we had the various uh, experiences in um, assessment where we had uh, a high risk of reoffending, but the level of risk of serious har uh, harm was very low. For example, I used to work with um, a member of Roma community that was uh, uh, that had um, multiple offenses for shoplifting, and uh, her risk of serious offending was uh, her risk of reoffending was very high, but the risk of serious uh, of serious harm was very low. So uh, you can have uh, various combinations, uh, and um, it's very good to have this overview because when you an assessment that says, okay, this offender is a uh, uh, high risk offending, it sounds very serious, but when you look at this part of, uh, of a, a level of serious harm, when you have this also classified, classified uh, it's, uh, it's useful to compare these two. Um, our uh, our uh, questionnaire, the tool, uh, covers uh, these areas of genogenic needs, so it covers accommodation, it covers education and employment, financial situation, personal family relations, lifestyle, social, other social uh, relations, uh, substance abuse, drug or alcohol, emotional well being. Uh, this is the area that covers the most the, the mental health and the emotional adjustments, and uh, thinking and behavior, attitudes. And uh, health, um, that's more uh, for a physical uh, health and other, other diversity issues. Uh, so we have, uh, I prepared for you this scheme for using SPP blocks. The SPP has three blocks. Uh, for all offenders, we are using the first block. And uh, the first block, yeah, uh, it gives you an overview uh, with the statistical uh, factors that we are scoring. And uh, this is like an introduction uh, it, in order to use the second block or the third block. So if the offender in the first block is estimated as a medium or high risk offender, we are, uh, and we are doing the block two. And if uh, in the first block offender is assessed as a low risk offender, then we are filling out the block three. Uh, the differences be between block three are in its size and in the in in scoring system, because the three is more of a descriptive um, uh, assessment, and the block two is a combined a scoring system description. Uh, 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 kind of uh, 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 assessment for each area that I mentioned in the criminal, criminogenic needs. And uh, if in the block one, we have a low risk offender, 
and uh, but risk of uh, physical harm, sexual harm or emotional harm is detected, then we are always doing a block two. Uh, I know it sounds complicated and I'm not very sure if I explained it good, but we will have more time in questions and answers. So maybe I will have a do over if I didn't uh, do it well now. So I will now show you uh, from the block one, these are the statistical factors that we are uh, looking. And uh, we are looking for a uh, criminal uh, background. Uh, we uh, had these adjustments because we didn't have the information if they did uh, offenses when they were minors. So we didn't have those data because of the, because the data is classified and probation office have insight in this data. We put, uh, so we put some other types of questions in order to have these kinds of information. So uh, we are trying through a conversation to see did, uh, did some uh, uh, or offenses before 18 and you can do the questions for yourselves uh, on how we are trying to gather this information. Yes, Gerhard says it's important to have a good with the offender and it's a, it's a skill it's not that it's so important the skill on how to use the that it's very important so part i think it's uh, to have a properly educated uh, staff in this tool because if you're just questions and filling out the the the, uh, the boxes will get uh, um, a good, uh, a good assessment. So this is the experience that I put uh, that I find interesting. The description in the instrument of, of the levels of risk. Interesting one is the low risk. Very stated and stressed that there is box or no assessment that risk because we are not with people that are. Uh, and we cannot vouch for it that it doesn't have a, a or for serious harm to us. So um, that and I will get to this part at the end of my prison. So I chose the part from the from the block. Uh, this is the part um, that the uh, accommodation area. So this is the questions we are asking. Uh, our, our offense. So we are trying to the conversation answer these kinds of questions. Uh, what kind of uh, accommodation is now? Uh, how is the sustainability of the accommodation? Um, what we the of the accommodation? Are they moved? Um, what neighborhood do they live in? What kind of an infrastructure do they have? So we are trying to through the conversation, not to add these specific questions, but to formulate our conversation in order to get the answers to these questions. So um, uh, I would give you an overview for all of these, uh, but then we would uh, be uh, discussing this. If you would have any, you can always uh, contact me and I will try to translate all the area you all the answers I have, but in order to make a good assessment annual, that is uh, very large, but it's very detailed. To fill me in on what you heard, last you were explaining uh, the assessment where the person is living about the conditions, and you mentioned how there are many different details, but we will not talk everything through. So I think that you can uh, now continue from uh, from starting to talk about assessment manual. Great. They have a digital and a paper version. Now, like 95 we don't read meaning to lend, but we are always using it. 
And it's very useful because sometimes when I don't know how to score a certain um, area, then I read the manual and I read the, what, the, the examples for scoring. And it helps me a lot uh, to, to, I think, to make an appropriate uh, mark. So I put here uh, the example for, for scoring uh, some, some questions regarding the accommodation. So you can, you can read uh, on uh, why we score something with two and one with one and with uh, a zero. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the zero the, is uh, when everything is okay or close to okay. Uh, we score one when there are some issues but, uh, and we score two where when the, we estimate uh, and the more potential for us. And in the end, when we uh, go through all, uh, all the box and all the areas and describe also uh, these areas, uh, uh, they are all, uh, after scoring, we describe them, which are why is this like this? We argument it. And we also stress the protective factors, also, if there are uh, some. And you get this table with weighted, uh, weighted points. And um, if uh, all the areas that are on the left, on the right side that uh, are referred to criminogenic needs, this is the areas we need to address with the, our work with, uh, with the offenders. Sometimes we have the situations where there are a lot of areas and then we need to prioritize among them which ones we can uh, we can we can um, we can uh, address um, we cannot address cannot address now but we can address later and also um, uh, this is not only useful for assessment it's also uh, very useful for us to set the treatment objective and to create an individual plan so uh, this is the tool that we use when uh, creating an individual treatment. And this is the tool we use when we uh, objectives or the goal of our work with the offender. We are stating it very clearly. What are we going to do? Who is responsible for it? Uh, how are we going to do it? Also the time frame the deadlines for certain activities. And um, the offender, we are trying more into this assess so we are trying to make them as, as a sub and as a participant in this assessment and not just as an object of assessment so we are also asking them for their contribution their view and we are also asking and offering them to sign this deals uh, that are uh, part of the assessment um, also um, for a few reasons, not only for their consent, but also for their motivation for uh, our uh, further work. Um, uh, I don't know how much time do I have because of this interruption of the internet connection, so I will try to be... Two more, two more minutes, Vesna, that we added, okay? Thank you. Great, thank you. That's uh, exactly how much I need. So the pros and cons for this instrument from the, um, I talked to my colleagues, some very love the instrument, some hate it, of course. I think it's pretty much the same in all countries, but we all agree that it's very structural, detailed. It gives you a very good overview. You saw the areas that we are addressing. So we really, um, we really are trying to reach all the areas of a, of a, source, of a person's life. So it's a unified assessment. So everybody is doing it like this. And we also have this part in the assessment where the PEO can say, okay, um, the risk is low or medium, but because of these and these and these reasons, they can argument their opinion and they can say, okay, uh, I uh, assess that, he is, uh, that, that he, the level of risk is higher or lower. So, um, uh, we are uh, gathering all the uh, evidence-based, uh, uh, we are estimating our decisions on this, so it's evidence-based decisions. And we, with uh, the application of this uh, tool, we also have a, like a protection of the probation officers that says, okay, it's not just my assessment. I did the, the instrument and the instrument is showing us. 
So I think the, pro the probation officers have this for, uh, for a certain type of a pro protection of their work. And it also it's important that it can always be revised and it's uh, suggested to be revised every six months up to a year. So we can monitor and uh, evaluate individual progress. And also um, um, circumstances can change. And because of that, it's very useful to do a revision of the, uh, of the SPP. So, uh, and the, the, the cons. Uh, um, it's uh, also a pro, but it's also a con. It's always subjective. So, um, what's a problem for me? It doesn't. Mm, it doesn't necessarily ne mean that it's a problem for my colleague, and it always has something to do with my experience, my value system. So, I will define something as a priority or a problem, but my colleague won't. It's very time-consuming. It's all in order to do a qualitative interview with the offender to gather information. You need at least two interviews because we have um, a legal deadline to do this: thirty days from the first meeting. Meeting. So it's very, very time consuming. You need uh, for approximately for four or five hours to do it, just to write it down. And you need interviews with the offender. And of course, to read all the information you get from the verdict, the, the other documentation that is available for us. And um, this uh, subjective assessment that uh, my opinion is that POs often uh, overrate the risk because it's better to to, to rate it higher if something happens than to rate it lower, because if something happens, somebody will ask you, how did you rate him low? And, it, and this happened. And we all know that uh, the intervention in order it, for it to be effective, it needs to tackle the, the, the medium and high risk offenders. And we have a risk of uh, impose, risk of contrib contributing to reoffending if we we include the low low risk offenders into interventions. So this is very very um, uh, a question for for discussion, and it's also not very suitable for sex offenders and family violence because um, it's not very sensitive for these kinds of uh, for offenders because we all know that um, sexual offenders are very high function functioning people so they are they are often estimated as very low risk um, uh, offenders with these instruments and we are still in not uh, we are still waiting for the validation of this instrument so we this is our next thing to do so, then, then we will have much more information about the validity of it and the accurateness of the instrument. So I'm very sorry for the for the for the break in the connection. I hope um, you had some uh, good information from the presentation, and I thank you for your um, attention. Thank you so much, Vesna. Don't worry, we all understand the technique and how it can work for us or against us. But I have to say that from my perspective, I think that your Croatian internet was uh, very similar to probation officers. When you talked about pros and cons in the end, we heard you very well. But when you were in that uh, long, long time consuming part, it just broke you down. So <laughs> I see some connections. Thank Thank you very much. I saw there is a question for you for later, so please stay with us. And one big uh, applause for uh, Vesna. Thank you so much. And now we are moving to our third and uh, last presentation. This is a risky business exploring variation in probation risk assessment and factors influencing clinical assessments. So we have with us today Amy Thornton. She is a head of public protection from West Midlands in the United uh, Kingdom from Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service. And I'm really happy to say that Amy has over 12 years of experience working for probation services of England and uh, Wales. She worked in different locations such as Black Country and Birmingham. And from her educational background, uh, she graduated from University of Cambridge and also from the Montfort University with uh, law and criminology. So it's an honor to have her and something I didn't know before, but the webinars allow us. I saw that Amy has a very nice cat that is assisting her today. So uh, 
Amy, you and your uh, cat assistant have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, bear with me. I think I've just uh, come off it. It'll just be two secs. Um, it's quite timely, actually, for the um, conversation that we were just having. That um, some of the things that I was looking to talk about today was around um, the subjectivity of risk assessments. Um, and um, I think it was just really interesting looking at actually some of the subjectivity and the different things that happen is very similar across different places and different continents. So it's quite exciting to kind of see some of those things with the same risk assessments. Um, so can we see my screen now? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so one of the things that we want to talk about is who we are as probation in England and Wales. And I think we have been very established as a probation service for a long time um, and looking over on Gerhard's assess, um, um, a presentation earlier, he talked about how the BRIC tool was based on um, or was influenced by a number of other different tools. And one of those was Oasis from England and Wales. In the probation service in England and Wales, we have um, about 7000 probation professionals. Um, and we have a huge drive at the moment to continue to recruit into probation officer vacancies. We've had lots of changes in probation um, in England and Wales over the last number of years, and we've been a number of different organisations. We were responsible for sentence management, along with accredited programmes, unpaid work and structured interventions. One of the things that we're very keen on is strengthening the probation practitioner's relationship with people on probation and making sure that we've got the right skills to be able to support that plan of desistance and reduce the risk of offending and the risk of harm to communities. But risk is absolutely central to everything that we do. And I think it's why it's so important there's so many of us on this call, to, on this call today. Criminal justice decisions are so exceptionally important in what we do and they have huge impacts on people in probation and the wider public. Where we assess somebody as high risk, it can impact sentencing decisions and it can impact on the intervention that people undertake. And when uh, Vesna was talking around the subjectivity, what is important for one person might not be for the next. And that's when I started to think about, do we become tolerant to risk? If you work in the center of Zagreb or in the center of Birmingham, do you understand risk? Do you see risk an awful lot more than maybe in some more rural areas? And does that change our subjective assessments? And then I started to think about the consistencies in risk assessments between different places in the Midlands and across the United Kingdom. I'm sure that it's very similar to other professionals on this call today, where we have transfers of people between um, organisations or between areas. We all seem to argue over what their risk assessment might be. And again, that's looking at that subjectivity. But what I was particularly interested in in undertaking a study is looking at what we think about risk assessments. And actually, when we're using the tools of BRIC and SPP, OASIS, what is it actually that probation practitioners look at? And what is it that they consider to be able to fill in those quantitative or qualitative boxes? Um, there have been many academics that have talked about risk, and I'm sure that lots of people on this call will have read some works by Hazel Kemshaw, who is a fantastic academic and probation um, expert who talks about risk being diverse and global. It's not about what is definitely going to happen, and I suspect that all of us in our professional capacity have almost wanted to use a crystal ball or be able to look into the future to assess risk as accurately as possible. But it is about what might happen. Um, even when we're looking at different aspects of risk outside, risk outside of the probation context, prediction is really difficult to be able to look. So in undertaking my master's thesis at the University of Cambridge, I undertook a piece of research that looked at the factors that probation officers use in making risk assessments and whether those factors differ between different groups and whether the outcomes differ between different groups. So my research questions were, do risk assessment judgments vary between groups of practitioners and what are the factors that influence decisions around risk? 
So my methodology, I did interviews across a number of different probation practitioners and I used short vignettes or case studies with each participant and asked them to assign a risk category and then looked at more detailed case studies with the group together. And what I found is absolutely risk assessments do vary by group of probation officer. It varies by how people interpret risk factors. As Vesna was saying, what's important to one might not be important to another. There was a huge influence of middle manager um, on the local practice. So in England and Wales, you often have to have your risk assessment countersigned or overseen by a manager, and that impacted on the outcome. Um, similar to um, Vesna was saying, and Gerard was around the faith in tools and the time it used to take them was impacting on people's outcome of assessments. Um, the fam familiarity with the person they're assessing and ultimately the fear of getting it wrong. So what I found is that the interpretation of risk factors changed greatly between people that were undertaking risk assessments. What we found is that generic risk factors were considered, for example, the offence detail. And there was a huge amount of emphasis on what somebody had done in the past. There was very, very little or, or fact, actually no impact of psychological risk factors. So we're looking at the age of the person and what they had done rather than trying to understand um, psychological factors and cognitions which as other people have said today there is a huge impact of psychological factors in terms of intervention it's very interesting that the probation practitioners that i interviewed and participated in the groups didn't consider psychological risk factors important in their decisions local practice had a huge impact on variation of outcome and middle managers had the ability to dominate assessments so instead of having a variety of people that were assessing the person sat in front of them. When it went to be countersigned or overseen by a manager, they can undermine that relationship with the person on probation and change the ultimate outcome. And the authority to change assessments was viewed very negatively by practitioners. I think as Gerard was suggesting earlier on today about the impact of procedural justice and how important that is to the person being assessed and also to the assessor, the impact of having an external person that can undermine has a huge impact on the legitimacy of the assessment, the legitimacy of the assessor, and absolutely the procedural justice of somebody under the criminal justice system looking at what interventions they may have next. And as we've talked today about BRIC and SPP, there are different tools that we use. Um, in England and Wales, our main assessment tool is the is OASIS, the Offender Assessment System. It has been changed and updated many times. I think we've got an update coming out tomorrow. When's the third? Oh, today. It's getting updated again today. But probation officers didn't recognise the strength in these tools. Research will suggest to us that tools um, are really important in reducing unconscious bias. They are essential in terms of consistency. And in regards to validation, some of the quantitative tools that we use are very accurate, actually, in giving us an idea of risk in the future to do with reconviction. But what we found is that actually probation officers didn't trust these tools and would override it with their own subjective assessment. In practice, it meant that practitioners could find more information to verify a high risk assessment. And the number of high risk cases appeared dependent on the amount of time an officer had to spend on an assessment. Because of the timeliness of how long it takes to be able to complete these tools, if you have a caseload of 50, very quick, less information going in and a lower risk. If you have a lower caseload, you have more time to dig, more time to speak to the person on probation, more time to gather all that richness of information, and we were getting a higher risk assessment. One of the biggest elements was around the factor of trust and honesty in the person on probation. And there seemed to be an underlying culture of the person on probation was risky until they proved otherwise. Um, but, the, but the people didn't talk about the how that felt went back. 
They view trust as a one way interaction of the person on probation rather than the probation officers as well being somebody that could be trusted to the person. Where people were breaching rules, they weren't just seen as non-compliant with the statutory order, it became very personal and they were perceived as lying to the individual officer. Now, where there were those instances, we found the subjectivity and risk assessment continued to grow. And it really did impact on the relationship between the person and the probation officer. Counter to that, there were some instances where people have been working with offenders for a very long time. And they became very familiar with the person and started to gloss over certain risk factors that were happening. There was a presumed level of trust there. And this is where we found familiarity in not just in regards to the person, but in regards to the offence type. What became really interesting was where we spoke to somebody in a city centre that was used to, for example, organised crime, gang crime and violence, they became very confident in assessing that type of risk and were able to give lower risk assessments. If I moved then to a rural team and they'd had somebody transfer there from previous gang history or organised crime, they felt they were the highest risk they've ever seen. And it was like an experience or a familiarity, not just with the individual, but with the type of crime that they were assessing. And this is where they started to become an aversion to depart from the high risk assessments. They felt a comfort or a safety in that. And as Vesna said earlier, there is that fear of getting it wrong. We want to make sure that we've got the correct risk assessment. And there was a reluctance to reduce risk. And that was echoed across all of the groups that we spoke to. But one of the things that concerned me hugely was how the fear of getting it wrong was influencing on the subjective assessments. All of the focus group discussed a sense of responsibility and this moral duty to get their risk assessments right. They also felt personally accountable, but there was an undercurrent and a culture of, if something does go wrong, it's my fault. I will lose my job. This will have an impact on me and my family and the emotional impact of having somebody that I have assessed wrong go on to commit a further offence. And some of the comments there that you can see is some of the comments that probation practitioners said. So we're so nervous about being hauled over the coals. I don't put anybody as low. I'll put them as high to make sure they get into accommodation. But the last comment there is ultimately I'll get the sack if I get it wrong to cover my own arse that I leave them as high. And we talk about the impact of having somebody as high when the decisions about whether they're going to get released from prison, what intervention that they're able to undertake. The fact that we've got this level of subjectivity that can increase, do our risk assessments say more about us as the assessor or the person that we're assessing? Um, and I think there has been some research in the last couple of years about the recall position in regards, actually, are we assessing that person or is it us? So overall, I found that judgments do vary across the groups of practitioners. Office location, age of practitioner and experience impacts on the risk assessments, as did the relationship between the person that we're assessing and the assessor. There was variation in some offence types more than others. And there were variations in practice at both an individual and office level. However, all of the focus groups had a tendency to increase risk because of that fear of being wrong and being subjected to scrutiny. The factors most likely to influence decisions around risk was the offence details. All sex offences were completely precluded from the low risk category and there was a lack of psychological risk factors being used. Generic risk factors such as alcohol use, they were considered even if that person had never used alcohol. So there was some consistency, but things that weren't relevant to that individual. So when Gerard was talking about that lack of individualization across the different risk tools, we certainly found that here. But trust and honesty were really significant factors in all the focus groups. 
um, and they were defined consistently by probation officers. There was a mistrust in tools and not all risk factors were considered. And our fear led to an aversion of risk. Um, so what I just wanted to point out, take this opportunity to say that the, the programme that I undertook where this thesis was completed was the master's programme at the University of Cambridge. Um, and just to say thank you to um, the Institute of Criminology for their support in undertaking this thesis. And to, um, I know that they would welcome all manner of applications from people on this call. Um, and hopefully we can have some questions in the question and answer session. So hopefully I've stuck to time. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. You did, you were perfect on your time, but most of all, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. It was uh, really good to hear and you really raised a lot of points and uh, discussion topics. So thank you for that. But for me, it was also very important to see how when, when you gave your presentation, you many times mentioned something that was already said by Gerhard and by Vesna. So this is how, you know, actually the probation family is really small. We might live far away. You know, we have a Norway in the north. We have a UK island. We have Croatia a little bit further south. But actually all these issues and the challenges that we have are actually some something that we have in common, no matter what type of uh, offenders and what kind of uh, legal systems we have in our country. So um, thank you very much. One virtual applause for Amy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for uh, for sharing for sharing this. I really enjoyed the listening, and I'm sure that uh, other uh, participants did too. I can see many questions, so uh, now I'm uh, giving the floor to Anna, so she can moderate this um, this part. Anna. Yes. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for these three very interesting presentations. Actually, for the brick, it has been really fascinating to see a very well-planned assessment tool, which it, which really includes offenders' perspective and really involve offenders in their own the distance process, which is crucial for reintegration and to avoid recidivism. I really would like also to highlight the creation assessment, interesting and also important that includes historical factors plus dynamic and aesthetic factors and a crucial element of including protective factors necessary to empower clients through the path of assistance. And I also found it uh, very thoughtful reflections uh, on Amy's presentations about the subjectivity of risk assessment. Although risk assessment is central in all what we do, there is also subjectivity uh, when assessing these risks and very insightful presentation, sorry, very insightful questions around tolerance to risk, consistency of risk, and also the fear of probation officers of getting the risk wrong. So, so many questions and interesting reflections. Now, uh, I don't want to steal you more time of this webinar and I'm going to start with questions. I first have a question, a general question, <clears throat> for you three, and is, um, are your uh, assessment tools used for all the sentenced offenders in probation? What about the offenders sentenced to community work? In these cases, is the intervention focused in serving the sentence, do the work, and no assessment is needed? And then this question continues a bit later saying, um, in which cases do you use these risks needs tools? Which kind of offenses, of sentences, the length of sentences, and other considerations? So who would like to, to start with? I can, <clears throat> I can start by uh, answering since the question starts with, is brick used for all sentence offenders in in, <laughs> uh, in, in principle it is. But of course, there are some sentences that are so short that um, there is not really 
an opportunity to perform a brick or to uh, draw any conclusions of it that are can be relevant in in the reintegration process um we always have a focus on reintegration uh, also when it concerns community service or community work the thing in norway is that uh the court sentences you to uh, a certain number of hours community sentence and then you go to the probation uh, probation office and you have an interview there uh, an intake and you discuss uh, what kind of uh, issues you have what kind of uh, possibly community service you would like to do what kind of work you can do where you where you can uh, make a useful contribution also in your community work uh, and then the probation service together with the um, with the uh, offender decides on the contents of the community sentence so this can be in some cases it can be let's say a hundred percent community community service so work unpaid work for the community or it can also be about maybe 10 percent and 90 percent will consist of other types of measures for example programs or or other types of interventions that uh, will contribute to uh, reducing the reoffending. so um a, a short answer is yes we use it for all sentence offenders in probation with uh, the exception of very short sentences and uh also for those who will be doing community work excellent thank you gerhard i don't know if ami would like to say something about it yes um yeah we use um the oasis assessment for all people on probation in england and wales our oasis assessment has two different has different layers so if somebody has straight unpaid work, it's, again, it's slightly different, isn't it? Sentencing in England and Wales compared to some of the other areas. So the court will dictate the type of community sentence that somebody is to undertake. Mm -hmm. So you may get a community order that has got, the court will say how many hours unpaid work and the court will say whether a programme needs to be completed. And that's quite often influenced by a probation officer assessment at court. But an oasis will be completed on all different people um, slightly lower detail if somebody is on straight unpaid work. If somebody is just on a curfew, then we don't undertake an OASIS assessment. Our OASIS assessment has certain questions in it that are added in if the offence is of a sexual nature or if there are previous sexual offending. And that's based on a, an additional study called the Active Risk Measurement Service um, System which was introduced by the police in the absence of OASIS to make sure that we're recognising the risk and needs of people that have sexual offending. Um, and we'll see that people also undertake OASIS assessments in custody. And that OASIS assessment is made available to the parole board for any subsequent decisions. So anybody for any offence, but there's certain different levels. If somebody is, is assessed as a low risk of serious harm, then the assessment is much shorter. If somebody has got any harm factors within their assessment, then we then need to add a risk management plan on the end of our OASIS assessment, which says some of the other different factors that we're going to undertake. Excellent, thank you very much, Amy. Um, Vesna, would you like to add anything to this or shall I, yes? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, we do do it for everybody. It's uh, d different than than Gerhard and Amy said. We are mandatory doing it for all pre-trial reports and for all sentences that have a protective supervision. So if the offender only has community work, we are not doing this evaluation, neither the short or the full version. Uh, but if there is community work combined with something else, then we do it either short or full version. So uh, this is just a difference between between the systems. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think that this question has been uh, very well answered uh, by all four uh, presenters. Now we go to the second question, and it's for uh, Gerhard. Uh, can offenders see the answer for evaluate, evaluation of the assessor? Thank you. Yes. Will be shown uh, after the uh, after the interview is performed, as I um, mentioned in my, my presentation. Uh, it used to be, uh, like I said, done uh, through a, th a shared screen, or at least that, that the, both the offender and the assessor would look at the same screen. But 
I'm not sure whether this already has been removed, but it was a conclusion of the, uh, the uh, research that we did. Excellent. Thank you, Gerhard. Another question for you from Slovenia, Simona. Excellent presentation, Gerhard. We are wondering what happens with those who refuse to participate in RIC assessment. What are the consequences? And do you prepare the sentence planning for with them? Yeah, um, no sanctions or anything. I mean, I mean it's not possible to, to uh, impose any sanctions on somebody who refuses to give up uh, certain types of information, but we will convey to them, we will, we will say very clearly that uh, not participating will also deprive you of the advantages of the, uh, of the BRIC uh, instrument. So that uh, we will not be able uh, in the same way to assess whether you uh, should be referred to a certain service provider or a certain program or a certain uh, caseworker. So uh, we, we try to communicate that. And uh, of course, we will do the sentence planning anyway, but uh, through other means, uh, more clinical means, obviously. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Gerhard. Another question for you from Liliana. Um, does BRIC have a special assessment areas for those convicted for hate crimes, extreme violism, or terrorism? And second question, you mentioned how BRIC created different expectations. What are the practitioners involved in the system's reintegration besides prisoner staff have access to the results of the BRIC assessment? And this is reflects to interagency cooperation. Gerhard, you are muted. so. We'll just unmute here again. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, there are no specific assessment areas for, uh, for specific types of crimes. In, in principle, as I said, everybody will uh, be offered the, the opportunity to go through a, a BRIC assessment. And um, we, we, after all, we are looking at uh, reintegration possibilities. And also those people who are convicted for hate crimes or extreme violence or terrorism will at some point be released back into the community. And uh, we, so we're looking at that. And um, as far as, because you, you can always ask the question, of course, when, when, when uh, you hear about this, this assessment tool, what, what about risk? Uh, we are in, in Norway, I think, lucky to have a staff ratio uh, staff prisoner ratio or staff uh, probationer ratio that allows for um, a, a, a an uninformed clinical assessment of individual risk in specific situations. We do not need uh, and we do not want a, uh, a structured assessment of risk based on a number of factors that have been decided by, uh, for example, evidence-based research where individual variations can be very important. So we, we, have, this, we have the opportunity to uh, assess risk, but on a, an individual clinical day-to-day -day basis uh, and, and based on, on the assessments of those who work with this prisoner every or this probationer every every day in in daily contact? Um, so so in in that way we we do not need a specific risk assessment tool. Um, yes, and I'm I'm not sure if I'm still talking uh, on behalf of the whole <laughs> correctional service in Norway, but that was at least the view in 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 those days. So. No specific assessment areas for uh, for specific types of crime. Um, as far as the um, the access to the result of, of the BRIC uh, assessment, um, the results in themselves uh, and the data stay inside the correctional service. But of course, the the, the results, the answers that we get, uh, will be conveyed to the case managers from the assessor to the case managers, and the case managers will use that in their contact with specific service providers, and those service providers will then uh, be uh, given the information that is essential, that is necessary, you know, the, the necessary cookies uh, that we always click on uh, for for. Uh, performing uh, for, for giving their services to this specific uh, offender. Excellent, Gerhard, excellent. Um, we have another question from Marta Ferrer from Catalonia to Gerhard and Vesna. 
Uh, you didn't talk about pretrial assessment. What maybe is a subject for a further webinar, indeed. <laughs> Regarding pretrial assessment, I like uh, that all of you answer a short question. Is it compulsory for judges in your country to ask for a pretrial assessment report to probation services before trial? Uh, in Norway, it is not. It's not. Uh, it, it's not required. But it's it's done in a couple of uh, situations, of course, in a number of situations. But. Uh, uh, it's it's not a requirement for the courts or for the prosecution to uh, ask for a uh, a um, social report or what you what you call it. Nor in Croatia. So the judges can ask us, and if they do ask us, it's mandatory for us to do this full version of this evaluation. But if they don't ask us, uh, we we are not uh, men we don't do it mandatory. Uh, same in England and Wales. Um, and quite honestly, we would like it to be. We would like to be able to do that assessment. I can see other people nodding too. Um, we would like to make sure that decisions around that person are based on the individual, um, but it's not mandatory. We have probation officers based in all of our courts. And if we do not have time or the court doesn't ask us to complete a full report, we may be able to give all evidence upon that day even if it's just in regards to their suitability to complete unpaid work, if there had been any um, diversity factors, any caring needs, any things like that, that we know that that sentence would be impossible. Interesting. Thank you. Then more questions, because I see that we have 18 questions, so that's very lively. A question for Vesna, again from Simona. Um, how and why did you decide to use three level and four level scores? Probability of reoffending versus level of uh, serious harm? This is the part that we adapted with the original questionnaire. So it was like this uh, originally uh, from the, our UK colleagues in the Oasis. So for risk of reoffending, we have this low, medium and high. And for risk of serious damage, we have this low, medium, high and very high. And um, we, we don't separate it, we combine it. So or, or we include both, uh, both uh, um, components in our reports and in our evaluation. As I stated, um, just only the information that someone is a high risk offender uh, means nothing if you don't have this context that it's underneath it, what about serious crimes? So if he will uh, highly reoffend in shoplifting, he's not very a uh, high risk offender. But if the, the level of serious ha harm is very high, it doesn't matter if he's high or medium risk offender, we will always uh, take this into account, this level of serious crime. I hope I answered the, the question. Yes, I think that you answered it very clearly. Uh, now I come with a question for Amy. Uh, why, uh, sorry, uh, do the offenders participate on a voluntary basis as is unaware or is the assessment mandatory? Um, complete, it's mandatory for the probation officer to complete the assessment. So everybody needs to have an assessment completed upon them. Whether the person on probation or in prison engages with that assessment is slightly different. Similar to as Gerard was saying, we can't force somebody to tell us information about them. But the probation service in England and Wales mandates the practitioner to complete the assessment. And obviously the fear of that is that we undertake assessments without speaking to the person that we're assessing. So we would undertake a file assessment, looking at their previous convictions, looking at factors that we, we might know about that person in the absence of them engaging with us. It does impact on the value of the assessment. It impacts on the legitimacy of the assessment. Um, and if we think of the consequences of what that assessment might be used for in sentencing, in parole releases, the parole board would know that the person hasn't engaged. Are the parole board then going to judge that person for not engaging? Are the decisions then going to be harder on it? So it's essential for the probation practitioner, but not necessarily for the person on probation. But we would always try and encourage. Yes. Um... Now I will come uh, again with a question from Dugui from Turkey. 
uh, in general to you all. I think that Gerhard has already mentioned it or answered it a little bit, but um, again, in general, do you check answers that offender give by way of getting information from relevant institutions or from database systems? I mean, we, we certainly in England and Wales, we will always try and verify information. So if we're interviewing somebody and they might be talking about their relationship history and they may very well tell us there has never been any um, domestic or family violence, we will verify that information with police call out logs. Um, we will verify information from health services in terms of mental health need or veri verification. And that isn't to catch somebody out or to impact on the relationship. Is to ensure it's to ensure that we've got the most accurate and up to date information to do that assessment, because one of the critical differences in between Oasis and some other tools is that it isn't just a risk need responsivity tool. It is also a risk assessment tool. Um, so the purpose of that assessment is multifaceted in terms of decisions and organizational defensibility. So from our point of view, yes, we do try to verify. Whether we get that information sometimes, I must say, is quite difficult to be able to get, but we will always try and verify information where possible. Yeah, um, crucial element of interagency cooperation. Get hard, please. Um, contrary to what Amy is saying, uh, BRIC is specifically not a risk assessment tool. And um, the information that we get from the, from the offender is uh, information that we have to uh, sort of accept and, uh, and uh, trust that he is giving the right information because um, the, the aim that we have with, with BRIC is reintegration. So uh, any information that would be given by the offender that is not correct would uh, work to his disadvantage in a way. And if you look at the categories that we have in, uh, in BRIC and uh, some of the screenshots that I showed on, on the left side, then you can see that there are, um, the, the categories are mostly, um, let's say, uh, harmless in, in, in the sense of, uh, of a risk assessment. And of course, BRIC also includes uh, information about the offense and about the, the history, but these are imported from other systems into the BRIC, uh, the BRIC results. So um, I would say it will, if somebody doesn't tell the truth about something, then it will eventually become, become clear. And, and we communicate to the, to the person that it will not be very helpful to, uh, to give wrong information. Excellent, thank you. Besna, would you like to add anything else on this? I would like to. I'm, um, our system is um, more um, likely with the with the UK system, so we do collect data and we use the data that we have and share uh, information in tri agency. But um, uh, for me, I think the the important thing is that offenders often lie or give um, socially desirable answers. And that is also the importance of the data that we get from them. So may maybe I read um, a research from Australia that uh, the ones that try to, to show themselves better are less risky because they, they need this image that they are very good and that they are okay. And this why they are in probation is more like an incident than their regular behavior. So uh, when I started working, this was I was very angry at this. Why are they lying? Why can't they just say they did it and let's get it over with? And sometimes when the offender would come to me, I would say to my colleagues, yes, he came in and he sat around the table and he said, yes, I did it. And I would, I would, do, I would do it again. And I would say, oh, it, I, well, I felt like I wanted to jump across the table and kiss him in the forehead. We have this expression because he acknowledged the fact that, that this happened. But later in my other experience, then it showed that these kind of people that said, yeah, I, I did it and I will do it again This because of this and this and this was uh, j just uh, um, a more uh, um, a level uh, uh, a level high uh, risk offender than the ones who wanted to show themselves as a, as a good citizens that this is an incidental behavior towards them 
So um, it's good that they lie. I, I like it now. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting perspective, uh, Vesna. Thank you. Now another question from uh, Romania, Ioan Durnescu. Well, thanks for the great presentations, uh, bearing in mind all the limits and opportunities provided by the existing tools. How would you see the future of risk assessment in the probation work? <laughs> Challenging answer, perhaps? <laughs> what a great question. Um, Professors always ask difficult questions, <laughs> bear in mind. Go, Amy. I, I think that there is never going to be a one size fits all assessment. When we're looking at assessment, I think it's really, as Gerard and I have said, the, the difference between brick and oasis is, is it a risk assessment tool or is this a needs and intervention tool? I think what, from my personal view, from, from my background and what I would understand, I would want there to be uh, risk assessment tools that are based on empirical evidence to be able to gather as many risk factors as possible. But what we can't do then is exclude the individuality of that person. And it's blending the risk assessments and the risk tools that we have. What I think it's really important for us to do is understand the purpose of the tool, is to have risk tools that we might want to use to be able to use other protective factors, to consider the use of custody or to consider the use of punitive elements, to consider polygraph testing that we use in the UK or curfews. And I think those tools are helpful to decide what we ought to do with somebody. But the risk, sorry, but the need and responsivity tools, to me, sit separate for that. This is when we absolutely look at that individual and what works for them. What we know is where we have interventions that aren't based on the individual, they can have that slightly criminogenic need. If you think of some of the sex offender group programmes we've had in the UK. So I think... For me, the future of assessments would be to have that duality, to make sure that we have the purpose of the risk assessment and those things that we're using that for, but then also maybe to consider the intervention. If I think of Hazel Kemshaw's four pillars, where we have the supervision element, the control element, intervention element, and contingency. I think splitting it across those different four elements gives a richness and a difference for the individual, but also basing on some empirical evidence. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Johan, as usual, uh, a challenging question. Um, I can, I'd like to answer from a personal point of view. Uh, like I said, I'm not sure anymore whether I represent the views of the director of, uh, of correctional service in Norway, but I, I think I'm quite close. But my personal view is that uh, risk assessment um, should not be structured and standardized. My personal view is that risk assessment should be clinical and individual and based on the day-to-day -day experience that uh, officers, either prison or probation, have with the offender. And that this assessment will be used in order to take decisions as, uh, in, in connection with the implementation of the sanction, the implementation of the punishment, uh, what kind of regime uh, will they be granted leave? Uh, will they be uh, granted uh, release on license, et cetera, et cetera? Those kinds of more or less technical decisions should be based on a risk assessment, and that risk assessment should be clinical. Uh, as far as reintegration decisions, I think we can make a more standardized and more structured tool that uh, can be used uh, to to uh, to the advantage of the uh, of the offender and the community that he will return to that's my short answer and uh, i'm i'm sure johan is uh, actually trying to find out whether he can write some sort of article or book again about this but uh, in that case go ahead johan <laughs> Well, uh, very interesting questions, very interesting answers. I think that Vesna would like to add something to this. So Amy and Gerhard gave such great answers. I'm really not sure. Uh, my answer is I really don't know because I think it will depend. We, we, we need a some kind of a risk assessment because we, we need it. But I also agree with Gerhard, we, we need um, we need to do it in, in, a, in a different kind of conditions. So I, I, would, I would agree with this cl clinical version 
of the assessment. And I, I would like to add that I think it depends on the society and that the, that the Norway society has a lot of resources uh, in, 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 its, uh, in its local network. And when you have all those agency and your local, in your local networks that you can use and you can connect and you can use to support the offenders, um, it's, much, it's much easier to have this approach. And when you live in a society that doesn't have this um, uh, age, uh, network of agency in your, in your local areas, then you have to do a risk assessment because you need to tackle, tackle the risk because you don't have the means to answer to the needs. So um, I would very much like for the future to be tailor-made for all of our needs, but unfortunately, um, it's not up to me. I'd, I'd just like to add something. Uh, I've always had some sort of antipathy towards a, a, a tool where you have, let's say, let's say 40, 50 questions or so, and each of them can be answered by a zero, a one or a two. And very often you're not quite sure whether it's a zero or a one or a one or a two. And then you take a decision. That decision may in many cases be quite ambiguous. And then you add them all up and you come to a total score, which means either high or medium or low. And that score is very, very influential for how you will serve your sentence and what will happen once you are out of prison. Uh, whether, you, Like I said, whether you will be granted a leave or whether you maybe can go out on electronic monitoring or not can be the result of, of like, we said, like we said, many wet fingers that you just put up like that and you put them on top of each other and on top of each other and on top of each other and you come to it. To, to a final conclusion. And I was very uh, struck by what Amy said about uh, how there seems to be a bias among probation workers, among assessors to, uh, to sort of stay on the safe side and come up with a, a medium or a high score instead of a low score. This one quotation that you had that somebody said that I've never really given a low score. Maybe I should try that sometime. I mean, I think that was very, um, very, very uh, uh, what's the English word? Dis disquieting, something like that. Very, uh, yeah. It didn't give me a good feeling. Thank you. Well, this is a very nice conversation, really. Really, really, really. Uh, we only have time for two more questions. I'm going to ask uh, the question from Marta Ferrer to Amy, to Amy. Do you think that initial and permanent training of probation officers has influence in your, in your results? Do you think that probation officers are enough trained and have enough follow-up to use the risk tool? No, I don't. I think absolutely <laughs> it impacts on us. <laughs> When um, Gerard and Vesna and myself, we're talking about clinical assessments. I mean, probation practitioners are skilled. They are experienced. They are, have got a huge amount of knowledge to be able to make that assessment. So absolutely training makes a difference. In England and Wales, um, we, under, we undertake a training contract. There's some academic modules in it, but training is mostly on the job. We have a commitment at the moment to train 1500 new probation officers a year. We have very limited resource to be able to put into those 1500 probation officers a year. At the moment, our risk training is half the amount of time that I would want it to. I'm too much of a good civil servant to say anything dismissive about it. But um, I would want to see extensive training. In the research that I looked at, I absolutely could see a difference in between experience and training of that person in terms of their confidence. So where they were less experienced or the training was more light touch, they became very, very risk averse. So they were reliant on their manager. The comment that Gerard was talking about, those type of things became more and more so because of the fear of doing it wrong. And then the subsequent impact on those is huge. So I think training is very important, not in a naught, one, two, in that clinical assessment. It's analyzing what that person in front of you is saying. It's all that experience you have before, being able to verify those different elements of information and analysing it about what that means for that person in the life that they're in and with the resources that are available to them. 
Um, so I think it's a train, and I don't just mean classroom training, I mean speaking to people, I mean testing it out and having the ability to sometimes get it wrong and work out how we do to be able to work on that. What I'm trying to do in probation is have a shift away from these are the serious further offence that has happened and this is how you need to do your risk assessment to avoid that thing going wrong. What I'd like to do is change the training to these are really good assessments that have meant that somebody has been supported with desistance and these are all the good things that you can do in your job because I think it's much easier and it's much more appropriate for people to replicate successes. And that's what I think is really important with our risk assessments. We should be showing them how to replicate something that's worked and something that's really good. Absolutely. Thank you, Amy. And now the last question is from Joseph. And uh, uh, do you think uh, that it's necessarily to share, get in common the good practice elements of all these different tools and to develop somehow with the contribution of researchers, experts, a common instrument? Well, that would be nice. Um, I, I'm looking at the question and answer section that you, and you just took it away, uh, Anna, but I, uh, Josef, uh, I remember you, it was, a, it was a, a seminar, not on uh, long sentences, but on community sentences, if I, uh, if I recall that right, at Lila Holman. Uh, that's just for Josef. Um, I, I obviously, um, I think that the Norwegian system is, is the best and that everyone should use that. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a side comment, I have to say that Norway has a number of uh, conditions that make it a lot easier to use uh, the type of assessment tool that we do. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is a high staff uh, offender ratio, which makes it a lot easier to do it the way that, uh, that we, uh, we do it, or they do it. I don't work there anymore. But, uh, and on the other hand, it is also a fact that uh, Norway has, uh, it, is, it is a society that it actually is possible to reintegrate in. Uh, in the sense that uh, it's a very, very rich country. It has a very, very good social welfare system. It has low unemployment levels. It has very, very few housing problems. Uh, all these kinds of central features in, in the lives of, of offenders uh, can, uh, and to a certain extent, be, uh, be managed. So that, would, that makes it a lot easier to say for me that I think that the, uh, the system that we use is, is uh, the best one and it should be used everywhere. But uh, of course, it's not always possible to just plant uh, one system or one tool in, into another community. Yeah, sure. Uh, cultural and social aspects need to be considered as well when we put in place any assessment, uh, risk assessment tool or others. Uh, the last, um, yeah, Amy, Vesna, anything you would like to add to this? Um, no, I don't Amy. think so. No, I completely agree. I think the difference here, and also the purposes of what the risk assessment is being used for, whether it's for pre-trial, whether it's for sentencing later on, where you have different judicial systems or different criminal justice systems, the purpose of the assessment needs to be tailored for what, for what it's being used for. So, I would love to see more richness of research about what works and I say what works in risk assessment rather than the criminological term what works but similar to Gerard recognizing the the social and cultural aspects of the communities is is essential really Well, thank you very much, uh, Amy Vesna Gerhard, for this very interesting presentation and conversation. Thank you very much to all uh, participants for all your questions. And now, uh, Jana, uh, the floor is yours again. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And I am really sorry that we prolonged a little bit our uh, webinar. You know, we were supposed to finish at uh, 1230, but we had such an interesting questions and uh, such a good answers that it would be really a shame to uh, not, not to take a little bit more time. So thank you very much for staying with us. Uh, I see how this topic was really good and interesting 
interesting for everyone. We hope that all our participants got the good answers and that they have some food for thoughts. Uh, and uh, we will also use all of this, what you asked and what we heard for some future activities of a CP. Uh, I would like to specially thanks to our uh, presenters. Thank you, Gerhard, for promoting Norway. Thank you, Vesna, for promoting Croatia. And thank you, Amy, for promoting UK, England and Wales especially. So it was really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Anna, for moderating and helping with all the issues around this workshop. And thank you all participants uh, for your activity and for your willingness to participate and we we hope that you learned something. Before I finish this um, workshop, I would just like also to invite you to follow the web pages of CEP to see about our uh, future events. There's plenty things uh, happening that is very interesting for all um, practitioners. Especially, uh, I would like to point out that there will be a face-to-face -face workshop on gender-based violence on 13th and 14th December in Barcelona, Spain. So uh, please check that because the deadline for um, uh, deadline is uh, approaching very fast. So thank you everyone and uh, see you in the future CEP activities. Bye-bye.